I'll just start with my usual setup and context. I have a thing that I'm really not interested in practices that can't save us. And that's in my opinion. So I have a lot of confirmation bias. But I liken uh, the way we're travelling at the moment to heading towards a cliff and we're going to drive over the cliff. If we don't turn around, I'm saying we may as well gun it and have fun. When I'm training kids, the university students and secondary and things like that, they love it. This whole idea that if, if we're not serious about what we're going to do, then we may as well just gun it and have fun. And they really like that whole idea. But I'm saying there's only two things to do. We either have fun now or we get serious about it, pull the handbrake on and drive away from the cliff. I, I liken a lot of our practices to being ones that only slow the car down. So this, this is why I think you know, that bag nitrogen clover sort of thing. Too much clover is still going to acidify the soil, leak nitrogen into the waterways, you know, cause cancer, do all those things. So it's better than bag nitrogen, but it's only, if bag nitrogen is pedal to the metal, which is what I think of it as, then clover is sort of only going half speed at the cliff, but it's still heading it to the cliff. So I'm just trying to set that context. I don't want to have to talk about every practice. When I was at the DPI, they used to wear me out because they, well, what's your opinion on this and justify that and stuff. And I'd just say, so I'd go, any practice that doesn't turn the car around and drive us away from the cliff, I sweep it all aside and say, I'm not interested in it. I go, other people are going to have to be, but not me. And so that's what I'll be talking about. The other thing that I've been really struggling to get through, and I don't know why, and I, I don't understand why, is that economically agriculture's in a bubble at the moment and it's not working. But people don't like to hear it for some reason. I was presenting to all these Collins Street farmers in the Athenaeum Club, and uh, I thought I'd got dressed up. I had a pair of chinos on and a chambray and a tie and a sports coat. Thought I looked pretty good. I walked in and they were just in the smartest suits you've ever seen, these captains of industry. I felt like I'd been dragged through the hedge backwards on the way there. And we had a, a chef serving us and a woman serving drinks while I'm presenting. It was, yeah, it was special sort of thing. So I, also, I said to them, you know that current agriculture is destroying biodiversity and I showed some data. And you know that no one wants to do it. You know, the age of farmers is getting older and the amount of people working in agriculture is declining. And they, you know, they sort of knew that. We all know that. But they didn't know that the debt's just going berserk. This is the debt, rural debt, versus the net value of farm production. You know, there's been a bit lately. I've been doing this for a couple of years, but they're starting to talk about the $66 billion worth of debt that ag's carrying in Australia. And the value is not increasing. So if you're interested in that, I've got a paper by an economist, Ben Rees, that, and I got it because he was presenting to DAF in Canberra. Um, what we're seeing a lot of is that people are sort of making some profit and making losses and it doesn't look too bad, but when you sum it all up, um, it, it's sort of leading to a lot of uh, loss of equity out of farms and that's work done by Tim Hutchings and I, I can do all those papers as well. And this is Tim Hutchings' work. The top 20% of croppers in New South Wales are cash flow negative if you take off farm income out of it. So if you want all that data, I, but it doesn't seem to help. It upsets people, so I won't do any more of it than that. But I go, I don't know why people are defending current agriculture, because it's not working. But it might only be from my confirmation bias and my point of view. So anyway, that's enough on the, the sort of the negative. I wanted to do uh, two segments. So how do we regenerate grasslands? And how do you do a practice paddock at home? I want you to go home today and know how to do a practice one so that you can decide whether it fits you. So it's not something that I say the little fella from Branksome sort of in southwest Victoria told you. You actually go home and see if it fits you. So what's the actual practice to do this? So how do we do that sort of uh, at a really low cost trial with your animals on your land with your viable soil seed bank, with all that climate and all those issues that you have on your place. So I'll, I'll go back and keep coming back to that. 
Um, I've been trying to work on this thing because it's, I'm getting crankier as I get older. I'm developing a new rant, I've been calling it. So I've been putting this up and then just saying, you know, which plant feeds more wildlife than any other plant? Which plant builds soil faster than any other plant? Which plant um, provides more human food than any other plant? Which plant, and then I go, and which plant was responsible for us getting up and walking on our hind legs? And that's why I've got that one up. And people are going like that, and I go, and I tried to do this thing with people, and I'd say, when did you stop thinking trees and start thinking grass? Because that's how important grass is. But it's just ignored. Do you know all the, all the grain family, all the cooling, all the, all the soil health is all driven by perennial grass, not the crop, sorry. But we need to know that that's where sustainable regenerative agriculture is based on, and Cole will talk about it as well. It's based on perennial grass. So we need to know that that's the core, that's the most important thing. I've found that that doesn't win me any friends either. See, I used to do this thing, you know, if trees are, the, trees are the answer, what was the question? And, you know, so now I'm going down this new rant of trying to do that sort of which plant was responsible sort of for us getting out of the trees. So unless we're going to do reverse sort of evolution and we want to go back to the forest and start walking on all fours again, I think we're going to have to learn to appreciate grass more is my point that I'm trying to make. Um, the carbon cycle is really important in understanding how to make a grassland function. And it's really about the decay part. So I'll focus a lot on that. Biological decay is a living process. It requires moisture and life. And a leading indicator is the fungal content of the soil. So we really know that that's where the carbon cycle gets blocked up, is at the decay thing. So everything we do, everything we add, needs to be focused on how do I increase decomposition or decay. Most of, the damage, um, most of the damage that's done to the soil is done from having bare ground. So bare ground's the lowest form of succession. So bare ground I describe as dying. So when we go out and have a look um, uh, yeah, with the monitoring and doing all that sort of stuff, it'll be about that. It'll be about um, bare ground is dying. So, the work that I rely on, this is CSIRO research, and it's done by uh, David Tongway and Norm Hindley, and they now retired from CSIRO, but it's, it's all available on the internet, and there's uh, sort of Excel trainers, and it's really, um, oh, yeah, like blue ribbon, gold standard science sort of thing. Uh, so, but what they were asked was, at the next rainfall, will the land be stable? Will it infiltrate water? And will it have a burst of growth and cycle nutrients? So what they did was then, well, what do I have to measure to predict those things? And what they had to measure was soil cover, which I go, well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? Do you know, like we all know that. Uh, basal cover of perennial grass, I find, is very poorly known. So how much of that area, how much of that hectare is actually covered by the basal area or the base area of the perennial grass? And then is there litter between the perennial grasses and is it decomposing? Overwhelmingly, those three drive these ones. And we control these with our management. <coughs> so if we want the land to be stable, infiltrate water and cycle nutrients, which I guess seems to be important. Yeah, it's like base level stuff, isn't it? We don't want it eroding. We don't want the water running off and we want it to be cycling nutrients so that we don't have to provide all the nutrients, then you've got to do those three. Soil cover, perennial grass and litter. Is that clear? Sort of. My wife always says, Graham, don't put that thing up anymore. <laughs> yeah, like, okay, but I love it. So it's like death by PowerPoint for her. But it's just these other things are important for getting the final number, but less, less important. So, Cryptogams, that moss and lichen layer, um, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, a lot of people like it, sort of in central Australia, and a lot of the ecologists and native grass people like it, but it actually, uh, the land can still erode underneath it. It cycles a bit of nutrient, 
but that, and a little bit of stability, but not much. Yeah, and this is about sort of, is there evidence of erosion and surface resistance to disturbance and slaking and some of the soil things. So, um, but it's really good stuff if you're interested in it. Colin and I and the other Stiper team members are actually using this to monitor 13 farms, so six in Victoria and seven in New South Wales for, for practices that increase soil carbon. So this is our monitoring tool that we use to determine whether we're heading up in soil carbon and that. And uh, there's a lot of research done by David on, um, on that. So his numbers mean something to me. You know, the, the one on the left has got better numbers than the one on the right. And you'd be surprised if it didn't. Do you know, like, so same soil type, just different management produces more stability, more infiltration and more nutrient cycling. When he's talking about decomposition, he's talking about this. This is in a grassland uh, near Lara, near Geelong. And uh, they call that slight decomposition. And it was just on the verge of going to what he calls moderate decomposition. So when you get slight decomposition, the, the litter will be decomposing like compost and it'll be turning brown. So we'll have a good look at that when we're out there. Moderate decomposition is visible fungal attack. We know that in healthy bush, if you pull the bark and leaf litter apart, you'll find that visible fungal attack. Well, it's the same in the base of a grassland. But we don't, or a pasture. Sorry, I use grassland to try and bust people out of thinking of pastures as all the same height and things like that. It needs that resource in the bottom of it to feed the soil biota so that you can actually start to cycle nutrients. That is that, that's what drives it, is that composting litter at that soil, land, uh, soil air interface. So we're actually just trying to drive that to, so that we don't have to provide all the nutrients, all the, all the sort of drainage, and all the you know, erosion protection. I'm really starting to like sort of some of the Evergrey's research because they're publishing their results in high resolution uh, photos and stuff, so they can go straight into my PowerPoint. I don't have to, <laughs> I don't have to. But this is work done, and this is what David Tongway's research has shown over 30 years ago, that if you have higher plant available water, see, this one here is the low production zone. It's got the highest phosphorus, so 55, 31, 21. But this one grows four tonnes, this one grows six, and this one grows nine. And it's about how that water infiltrating and being made available to the plants. So you need to be actually looking at that sort of, how can I change the land that I've been given to manage here how can I improve its nutrient cycling, water infiltration and stability because then you can start building something. The research is all heading in the same way. You know, every time they do a grazing trial, they're moving closer and closer and they're struggling with it because like we've been, um, well, I know I have been, hard to get along with with them. And uh, so, but yeah, you know, I keep saying you're not testing what we're talking about because we're talking about management that increases landscape function. So this landscape function, I did some work um, all through Stiper with uh, a big group called, and we had a communities in landscapes project in New South Wales, and it was look, working in the grassy box woodland. And this was um, work done by Peter Ampt and Sarah Doonbus at Sydney University. And all they did was compare fence lines between people that were trying to increase landscape function and others were, that were just doing sort of the current management. Uh, so they got better results for stability, infiltration and nutrient cycling. Um, they got better results for the amount of perennial grass in the area. So the blues, the perennial, are uh, the innovator and this is the level of perennial grass versus the other side of the fence. But it was the chemical results that really blew people away. And, Cole will confirm a few of these things, but they had higher pH without putting lime on. So if you increase the landscape function, you start to shift away from having a dominance of too much legume and clover, and you start to set up processes that will restore the pH of the soil. 
but you have to increase that. They had higher phosphorus, even though they weren't putting on phosphorus, um, so that'd have to be monitored for the future just to make sure that we don't run out. Um, and the nitrogen, uh, the nitrogen they had more available, and Cole's got some real good figures on that, and the soil carbon was higher. So it, it's everywhere we do this, this is what we find. You, if you increase the landscape function, you increase all those things as well. So they're directly linked. So the, the rate that these things change is different for different rainfalls and different soil types, but they're all linked. You increase LFA, you increase those things. Um, you know, and which, this is other work done by Judy Earle and Christine Jones, and it was just management versus the other one, so more phosphorus and more calcium. So, because I, th I think we're gonna sort of, uh, when you look at the uh, soil carbon methodology that's out for review, um, a lot of the inputs uh, sort of have a large uh, uh, CO2 equivalent effect, so we're going to need to learn how to do more of these things in situ at low cost and um, at low risk. Um, this is what I put up at the Stiper conference because people, um, uh, I try not to get scratchy as I get older, but people are always telling me what you're saying, Graham's impossible. And so I'm saying now it's impossible not to. So if you increase landscape function and perennial diversity, it is impossible not to increase these things, lower cost and risks, increase soil carbon, soil health and biodiversity. So, yeah, but it's, you can't do it without doing that. Some people are trying to make claims, I find, that they can do these things, but they don't want to do that. You actually can't trick it. You actually have got to make it happen. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's, it's sort of predicated on understanding the way a perennial grass plant grows. And this is all about sort of um, the yellow in these photos is the most important thing. So this is a, this is a perennial grass ready to be grazed and it'll, and it'll be, have no evidence of cut off tips. You know, you can see those cut off tips where you've mown. It'll be a good color and it'll contain fresh yellow litter in the base. And if that's what's happening above ground, you can assume that the root reserves have recovered. Competition for weeds is underground, not above ground. So you want really big root zones under the ground to not provide the space for the weeds. So I'll come back to weed management a bit later. Um, the plant, the sort of animal comes along and severely grazes the top uh, and pushes the litter onto the ground with their muzzles and feet. Um, and we find we can do this with sort of horses, cows, sheep, goats, um, sort of nearly any other, sort of those footed animals. So, um, and then the, uh, the plant takes its root reserves and uses that to grow fresh leaf. That fresh leaf then starts to become energy positive, gets enough solar panels, replaces the root reserves, it starts to do that, and then it's got fresh litter in it again. So it's that cycle from ready to be grazed through that back to there that we need to understand and be experts at. I'll go through some stuff. There's checking recovery sort of thing and I, I'm looking at the litter. So I'm trying to, I'll do that when we're out. I'll, I try to open the grasses so I can take my photo to see that there's litter in the base of the grasses. I'm saying it's about the litter. So. Um, uh, so the point of difference in what we're finding through our monitoring and work and sort of we're in partnership with Sydney University is that it's all really got focused on the litter. You'd agree with that, Cole? Yeah, yeah so that um, I'm saying for your practice paddock, you need a low cost current infrastructure, small area that you're not tempted to graze, uh, easy to monitor. That small area is really important for getting, um, you, want, you want stock density to not be a variable, so I push the stock, stock densities to be really high and then just have different recoveries, but I'll, I'll go back into that. And not tempted to graze, because you know, people will go, oh, there's my practice paddock, and I go, yeah, but why is the pony in there, or the rams, or, do you know, like you, you've actually got to make sure it is a practice paddock, so that you, you're sort of giving it a, a nice, deep muscle massage, and then a really long recovery and waiting for that litter to come back and then repeating. Easy to monitor and secure. We need to be monitoring towards something. And I'll go into this, but like this is all that landscape function stuff. So a dense perennial grassland. 
I'm trying to get people to think about their pastures as grassland jungles, that you've got understory, mid-story canopies. Do you know, at the moment, we're sort of running grass as like a two-dimensional sort of thing. So I'm saying, you know, we intuitively know that in the bush, don't we, about the mid-stories, canopies and things like that. But it's the same in the, in the grasslands as well. So more than 30 perennial species, we actually see, I used to say 75, but it was too many for people. So I've cut back to 30. So more, lots of species, lots of litter, visible fungal attack, uh, increasing perennial grass plant sizes, large bases, and a lot of diversity in landscape function. This is how we do that practice paddock. This is, um, this is down at Beng Warden in, um, near Bansdale, between Sale and Bansdale in there. It's really, um, it's really surprising, I couldn't believe it. It runs up to the lakes, but it's really low rainfall, and it's sort of like sandy, a lot of brackeny country and stuff. Um, and they have a lot of power, and all they did was put sort of some uh, weathers in a, in a little area, left them in there for a couple of hours, so you don't need water, but you do need it to be quite tight. Uh, they just trampled it, so they didn't take it back to the dirt. They just trampled it for a couple of hours. They ate some of the biomass out of that and left it there. And then it came back incredibly strongly. So this is before and after. Uh, it had higher function, decomposing litter, all those sort of things. I'm saying set up a little practice paddock for yourself at home and do that. Uh, if you don't have animals, then do it with the motor mower. If you don't, you know, wait until the litter's in it and then push the litter onto the ground, you could do that on a square metre. I'm saying everyone needs the, needs the skills to increase landscape function because it's only through agriculture are we going to stabilise, stabilise, stabilise our, our climate and um, all the other things that we need, clean water and stuff. Uh, and it's still going. Um, it was just a bit harder to see. That's the fence there between that and that. So. Um, in November. So I'm saying a grass plant, when it looks like an ungrazed plant, contains fresh yellow litter, that's the litter. Um, it depends on soil moisture and air temperature. This is all researched and in the literature. Um, we need to monitor for the litter. So um, you don't need to know how many actively growing leaves a plant has and things like that. You just need to look for the litter and see that. So. Um, that's, that's sort of what we'll be looking at when we go outside. Um, all the plants do it, so do you know, it's these bottom leaves start to die. I always say that um, perennial ryegrass is the one that's been studied the most because the dairy industry uses leaf emergence rate, but they don't like litter. They say that was wasted, it should have gone to the animal. And I'm going, if you send all the leaves to the animal, then you've got to put all the nutrient, all the uh, drainage, water infiltration and stuff, which is David Tongway's science. So, so I'm saying, you know, and down our way, they'll say that the litter's the stale lettuce in the bottom of the bowl and all that sort of language and stuff. So the way that plant grows is a leaf emerges, two leaves, three leaves, and then for the fourth leaf to emerge, that one becomes litter or dies. I'm saying we need quite a lot of that litter to fuel the system. So I'm saying uh, you can actually look up dairy calculators and things like that. There's an interlact dairy calculator on the internet and you can punch in where you live, as long as you live in a dairy area. And it'll tell you at, for that month, this is about the average emergence rate of these leaves. And it's driven by temp and, and it's driven by uh, temperature and moisture. Was there any comments or thoughts on that? that um, everyone familiar with that leaf emergence? So just checking for it, just seeing what's in the base of the plant and looking for this litter. Um, do you know, I've, I'm always trying to take photos of it and, and uh, of litter and what it looks like and getting that function increasing. Um, when we go out, we'll just be monitoring the soil surface. David Tongway uses a paint scraper to look at the soil because he says that's what we manage, it's that top centimetre. So that's what we're in control of. So we'll look at that when we go out and how he does that. So, um, and some of that monitoring and stuff. So those things, ground cover composting. But it must produce management change. So that'll be on the form too. So if you're getting more thistles and forbs and stuff, then we'll 
will know that the recoveries are too short, so we'll check increasing the recovery. If we're getting woody types coming back in, then we'll look at animal impact and sort of are we getting seedlings coming out. Is that going all right? Um, that's the form we'll use, but it'll uh, make a bit more sense. I've colour coded it. So bare soil means dying, litter no decomposition means at risk, uh, litter slight decomposition, re, you know, starting to recover, and litter moderate regenerating. So I've tried to actually make it really clear that <coughs> what these things mean. Um, overwhelmingly, when you look at problems with uh, sort of land health and oh yeah, climate health, sort of a whole heap of things, the problem is that oxidation is exceeding photosynthesis. So we've got too much fossil fuel and deforestation, losing too much organic matter out of soil, and this is always going to happen with this respiration. So I'm saying we need to reduce that one, the loss of organic matter, reduce that one and increase this one. So that everything that we do needs to be increasing photosynthesis. I don't have a lot of time for the, the plastic lawns and stuff like that. That cannot save us. That is just the biggest nonsense I've ever seen. And you know, like I wrote to Landcare because they were giving away you know, grass, plastic grass lawns for schools and, as an award in New South Wales. And I just go, what the? What? I didn't put that other word in. But you know, like, you know, it used fossil fuel to grow it. It doesn't cool anything. It doesn't regenerate anything. It's a disaster. And we've been sold a lot of things that are disasters. I, I don't know whether you've seen me do it, but I do that green shopping bags, you know, the woven shopping bags, and the kids get it really quick. I go, if we're going to drive away from the cliff, we've got to stop, you know, oxidising and things like that. And I go, all I do is say non-woven polypropylene made in China. That's where those green shopping bags come from. You know, by any measure, that's not turning the car around. If anything, I worked as an industrial chemist in my sort of first career, and you know, that was putting the pedal to the metal. You know, they got a lot of uh, bag miles to bring them in by ship from China, you know, it's, and it's made out of plastic. It's just crazy. So we've got to be really careful of greenwash. Um, someone was saying that the grass-fed spec allows them to feed palm kernel now for beef. And I just go, oh no, why does it, what? It's like a human failing, isn't it? So, um, yeah, so it, it's better when we cheat, I say. It's a bit like smoking behind the shoulder shed. It feels better for some reason. The, um, so that's a really important concept. How do we do this? Increase photos photosynthesis and reduce the loss of organic matter. That's what we're in charge of the big things. They must come to us at some stage because we will be able to fix it. Agriculture can fix it. Agriculture can destroy it. But agriculture can fix the environment. So only by practicing these sort of things, I believe, sort of have we got a chance. So um, just some weed photos. This is, um, I do that thing where I say it's a monoculture of Cape weed. Oh, no, sorry, there was some thistles. The, uh, um, this is what we took over. It was uh, a property we bought off Timbercore. The owners had sold it to Timbercore. Uh, they couldn't plant trees everywhere and we bought what was left. Um, but they uh, sort of, they weren't farmers. They sort of leased it out to the neighbours and they uh, cropped and grazed it all the way back to sort of the Stone Age and uh, hadn't re-sown it and stuff. So just using grazing. No inputs, no herbicide, no fossil fuel, no seed, no anything except the cows, we put it back to grass. So I'm saying that's the base level skill as a grazing person that we need. So in your practice paddock, a really good area would be on Cape weed or a problem plant or something that you've got, and you learn how to do this. Coal and Christine and Daryl Clough were we gave a talk at our place when we first did that and I got up and made the big pronouncement that I was going to get rid of it just by grazing. And Cole said, do you know how? And I go, no, not yet. But, you know, so it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, but lack of confidence was never an issue. But like, it actually takes some skill and knowledge and training and, and patience and things to do these things. So, but that's what I want people to be able to do with whatever. 
What I was trying to do was not eat the, the cape weed, was change the soil surface. So underneath that cape weed, it was like shiny. Do you know that sort of sealed cap look? So all I did was when the cows go through at high density, they do like a twist and they just loosen that soil, give some soil to seed contact, which we know about. So something else grows and it's really growing something else is the first step. And then when that has got fully recovered, even if it's an annual, I look at that. I don't look at any of the other things. And people think I'm, you know, because like I, I used to say to the neighbour, you know, what do you see? Because I couldn't see those things anymore because I was only, you know, I got too narrow. I could only see the plant I wanted to concentrate on. And I'd manage for that. When that was recovered, then I'd repeat. And that would then create the conditions for the next level of plants to come up and the next level. In our high rainfall environments, you can do this in 12 months to two years. In lower rainfall environments, that uh, you don't always get a season every year. It takes a bit longer. Um, so this is down in the Derwent Valley. Um, uh, a guy there got sick of that. And so all he did was start managing differently. Uh, that gets about 12 months recovery and then grazed for a month. Um, it's quite steep. It's, I was trying to get how steep it was, but it's a bit hard to see. Um, but do you know, like, so all that he converted over to that. He's only a young fella, which I thought was pretty good. Um, Ararat Hills, sort of up the top of the hills, some, you know, a land care area on the top of the crown of the hill. The, um, and that's got fresh, uh, you know, the highest point in the landscape, and that's got decomposing litter in it. Um, that's why I don't. So, yeah, you've got to be careful that you, with land class fencing, you just don't shift the, the erosion further up the hill. Um, uh, this is out sort of in the uh, South Australian Mallee um, on one of Earth's sanctuaries, Yukamurra, and they just were grazing this for a couple of weeks every 12 months with open the gate and let the kangaroos in. So it's that sort of thing that I'm talking about, this intermittent use at quite high density and then long recoveries. Um, Oh, I'll go through these when we go out. We need to get different skills. We need to get skills on recovery. We need to get skills on monitoring animal performance and gut fills and knowing what that means. We shift our animals when about uh, 10 to 10% 10 of them have got score threes, where you can just on the left hand side of the animal just see the triangle starting to come here. So we look at that. Uh, four, I'm saying straight through, and five's proud. Um, we check the dung scores. This is, I keep saying this, I was going through my MKR stage. So watery, custard, pie, firm, biscuit. So do you know, like, so we need to know that we need to be somewhere around there so that it's not too young, the grass, or it's not too old, the grass. And it's matching where the bugs in the rumen are today. So um, that's all available, sort of, we'll send it out to you. So it's just a bit of a cook's tour, same with sheep. Um, I think it's about a loose group of pellets, but it's when the animal's going well. The dung should look like when the animals are going well and sitting down all the time, when the grasses are hardened up near the end of spring. Do you know that sort of look? Um, get, there's a whole heap of stuff coming out. The get big or get out is really nonsense. Um, it was theoretically flawed. Um, so we'll, uh, I can send all that through, through Joel. Um, I'll just pull up there and take any questions. We've got some stuff on the data and creating this litter, and this is out at Cobar where they had litter in behind a goat gate. So we've been able to make it happen anywhere. So um, this is at our place with the local DPIs doing that. And this guy here is a New South Wales sort of feedlot DPI guy. And he said, where's the weeds? And I thought that was really good. If you've got weeds, it's sort of indicating that you can't manage is what I say and uh, that can be a bit harsh for people. Um, this is a guy uh, up the Vic Valley, and uh, yeah, this is uh, April 2013. We'd had a pretty tough, it was pretty dry down there, and uh, I think it was dry here, but it also had grass seedlings coming through, the ryegrass was coming through. 